everyone. Welcome again to our next FUBON Fireside Chat. Uh, today, we're going to talk to Amy Webb. I'm so excited about this one. I've been wanting to get to know Amy Webb better ever since I heard about her work. Uh, it's really, really cool. Let me just tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll jump right in. So Amy is the founder of of a uh, organization that uses a data-driven technology-led foresight method that helps you develop strategic foresight. Uh, it's called Future future today. And um, she has advised generals and CEOs, all kinds of Fortune 500 firms. And she now teaches a course at NYU on how you can use strategic foresight. And so without further ado, let's get her out here and give her a warm welcome. Welcome, Amy. It's so great to see you. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So let's just jump right into this. When you say strategic foresight, why don't you start by defining it for people and then tell us a little bit how you how someone develops or how an organization develops strategic foresight. Yeah, so strategic foresight is an academic discipline that goes back a century. And in a professional practice, um, you know, it's like accounting. Um, but it's, it's accounting for different data points. So the purpose of strategic foresight is actually not to make predictions. That's a little bit of an, a misnomer. Futurists who are trained um, don't actually make predictions, they make preparations. So this work is a detailed and systematic analysis of all of the driving forces, the longitudinal trends, um, the elements of change in advance of making big strategic decisions. And I know that feels like that's what organizations are already doing, but the difference is going significantly broader and looking for orthogonal connections in sort of a different way. Um, so our job is going out further than somebody who works in consumer insights or who works in corporate strategy. We go out further, we look much deeper, um, and we try to anticipate plausible next order outcomes. So this is really not about being prepared for everything. It's about being prepared for anything. Paradoxically, in organizations, you know, CEOs, the C-suite, uh, senior managers, they need to make decisions, um, which means they, the, the paradox is they actually need far more information than they currently take in. This is how organizations tend to get disrupted. So you have to take in way more information. However, you have to know which signals matter. So a lot of what this work is about is signal detection and reducing uncertainty in an increasingly VUCA world. So volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, and, and the whole point of this is either to identify emerging risks so they could be mitigated in advance or finding new opportunities, trying to understand other ways to grow when you have great uncertainty over a longer period of time, and it you know, might be challenging to make decisions. So that's what strategic foresight is. I'm the CEO of the Future Today Institute, which is a company I founded 17 years ago. Um, and we do this work for you know, Fortune 50s, for investment firms, uh, for schools, for governments all around the world. Um, and most of the time, what they're trying to get us to, what they're trying to unlock is where can we grow that we haven't thought of? We know we're facing disruption. How do we manage that first? What are the emerging technologies and science since that's you know, more of what we focus on that are gonna shape our future and sort of what do we do about it? Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what the company does uh, and my team and I, and then what strategic foresight, uh, what strategic foresight is. So how do you decide what signals matter, what data to gather? Like, it seems like there are just so many different places you yeah. could start. And you talked about you're going broader and deeper than the typical data gathering is doing in the organization. So you have to make a lot of choices about where right. you're going to go, right? Yeah. So strategic foresight, and I apologize. I just got uh, uh, Invisalign put on and I've never had orthodontia <laughs> in my entire life. Um, so this is this was not for cosmetic reasons. It was for jaw uh, issues. And I feel like I can't. I feel like you earlier lisping, you were like lisping a little bit. Now. Lisping. And I'm just <laughs> like, anyhow. We can't see the spit. That's the good news. <laughs> Drooling down the side of my face. <laughs> uh, signal data. Where, where does it come from? Um, so in strategic foresight, there are sort of different buckets of work. Um, at the start, you are looking very broadly for macro forces, um, 
weaken strong signals, and then what we would define as trends. And there, I'll come back to this in a moment, but like there are strict criteria governing and defining what, what each of those are. That underpins the uncertainties that we try to explore and scenarios. Um, scenarios are probably what foresight practitioners, futurists are known for best. It's also the reason that we are universally chastised. Um, and it's because you know, historically in a lot of companies, scenarios have offered interesting vision for the future, but not been actionable or they've been wrong. Um, and most often that's because they've been created incorrectly. But I also have the opinion that scenarios at this point are kind of old technology and they deserve to be created in a different way. Um, and then the final piece is backcasting. So this is where we kind of rehearse the future Given what we know to be true today, how do we re reverse engineer our plausible preferred outcomes? Where does the data come from? So my academic background is game theory and economics. And um, you know, I think one observation, I've been doing this now for almost 20 years, and one observation is that companies tend to look at, and research divisions specifically, they're looking at industry information, they're looking at near peer competitors, or near peer industries, and that's kind of it. And the problem is that at this point, change comes from so many different places that unless you're trying to forecast something with a very narrow set of variables, like the outcome of a baseball game, um, it's just very challenging to understand all of the different drivers pushing upon the outcomes of a particular line of business or a product uh, or an industry or whatever. So in our case, we begin with um, a framework that we use that is called the 11 macros. So these are the 11 macro sources of change from, from which really all at this point change eminence, uh, emanates. These are things like wealth distribution, like macroeconomics stuff that we all remember, um, wealth distribution, you know, infrastructure, but we're also looking at public health and education. And here's where things get interesting. You know, if we're looking at the future of trying to think of a project right now that we're working on that I can talk about. Um, what are the drivers of adoption of broadband 10 years from now? So what, what looks different? So a lot of people would go to things like OEMs and, and phones and what's happening with smart glasses and cars. Yes, we definitely want to take all of that in. But we also want to look at things like uh, indoor farming which feels pretty far removed, except that the external drivers of change are climate change and global food, uh, global supply chain breaking, breakages, geopolitics uh, that's, that's changing. So we know that there are accelerating factors that are gonna shift by necessity where our food comes from. That food is likely gonna come indoors, although it will take a little bit of time but for that to work, you need low latency, high bandwidth, 5G. So that's how I can connect spinach to Nokia, for example. Um, and, and that's just the type of signal data that most companies wouldn't pay attention to. So we're looking for quantitative and qualitative sources of data from all over the place. And then we use pattern recognition and again, more tools and frameworks to narrow down the, the signal that matters from all the noise. Wow. Okay. So you, you, you lost me right when you went from indoor farming, Nokia to spinach. Like I, I didn't understand how, why, where the bandwidth was needed in the farming. Yeah. Right. So, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a bit, but um, so it's interesting. There are ways to totally automate um, certain parts of, of modern agriculture. Now this, you talk to a okay. farmer and I've got if people that I grew up with who are who were commercial farmers, and they will tell you all day long, this isn't how it's going to be done. It can't be done this way. But as you know, probably better than anybody else, innovation happens, you know, when there's an opening. And at the yeah. moment, agriculture hasn't changed in 14,000 years, not really. Um, and the opening is going to happen because if you're a human who likes to eat food, uh, we're going to need to get- I'm a big fan of food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so the connection is um, it's possible to have warehouse sized indoor farms, indoor plant factories, um, where you can control things like climate and light and temperature and things like that. But you can also titrate the exact 
compounds needed that don't rely on existing commercial fertilizer, which by the way, also disrupted because of Russia. Um, you know, you can titrate organic um, solutions instead, but to do this at scale, especially when we're talking about enormous vertical farms or farms that might stretch a mile um, and be underground or something, uh, you, you need robots. Um, so, okay. Right. Now you so, got me. As soon as right. you said automation, I started thinking about robots and I'm like, okay, now I see where we're going to need the bandwidth. Yeah. So again, um, it, th this I know sounds inconceivable or just feels financially irresponsible when our current systems are cheaper, easier, faster exist. Um, but, but again, this is where, um, this is where those uncertainties outside of any one organization or country or person's purview come into play. This has an important downstream effect, by the way, on lots of companies. So we advised a company uh, two years ago. So this is pre-COVID, I guess, three years ago. Um, household name makes a very popular product that people like to eat. And their demand cycles were increasing, but their financials were flat or worse. And for the life of them, they could not figure out what was wrong. And they were trying to, and the, the question they brought to us is, well, how do we grow? So we start by looking at different sources of data. Anyhow, long story short, it turns out a lot of that product's ingredient hinges on one place in a part of the world where extreme weather events have been popping up intermittently, which has ruined a core crop that goes into this product. It just never occurred to them to account for uncertainty in volatile weather patterns. And because yeah. they are operating on super tight margins and their projections have always been raised like very, very accurate, it just it didn't occur to them. So how do you solve for that X? You just build an uncertain, you, you change your model to account, account for that uncertainty is one option. The other option is, and the smarter one, you're gonna have to build more flexibility into your supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you don't have to convince me. I've used the uh, an anecdote for a long time about the, the first vehicles versus horses. So mm -hmm. the first vehicles were actually steam powered and then electric. And they were they went like four or five miles per hour. And everybody laughed at them because a horse was cheaper, faster, easier, right. friendlier. And, and uh, up to five miles per hour, still laughing. Seven miles per hour, still laughing. Nine miles per hour, still laughing. Ten miles per hour, paying a little bit more attention. And then as soon as the cars hit 15 miles per hour, horse was done and right. it was over, you know almost overnight that suddenly nobody was talking nobody was building roads for horses and wagons anymore they were building roads for cars and building a supply chain around putting people in cars so i could totally see how that inflection point would come in agriculture uh, for a bunch of reasons but for vertical farming in particular because it strikes it's always struck me as incredibly wasteful that you're dealing with a unit like a two-dimensional plane surface for most agriculture right we've got sun coming down and a big footprint of earth that you're counting on if you could find a way to stack it and bring light to all those layers that would seem a lot more efficient just space wise right. right so again you know for any of you interested in innovation and the future one so one of the things that we do is we practice reperception um, reperception is intentionally so re perception. It's intentionally exploring white spaces. Um, and you have to do that with intention because there's a, a cognitive reason that we tend to get stuck on what's obvious. Um, forcing ourselves to explore white spaces and then confront our cherished beliefs is sort of a core component, I think, of excellent management and great innovation. But it's also something everybody should be doing all the time. So back to your car example for a moment. You know, the basic form factor of a car hasn't changed ever. And I will, I will gladly debate anybody. I'm a, I'm a car person myself. So I will be glad <laughs> to debate all day long. And yes, I recognize that we no longer have carburetors and things like that, but the basic form factor hasn't changed. Tesla um, is really the first company to truly innovate. And I would argue that Tesla is not a car company. Tesla is a company that makes batteries. Tesla is a battery company that happened to have put a car on top of it. Now, here's an interesting question. In 1917, um, as these cars were first hitting the road, somebody filed a patent for a flying car, 1917, more than 100 years ago. And every decade since then, 
somebody has stuck wings on a car, tried to fly it. And some of those prototypes have worked. Many of them haven't. But every decade since, you know, prohibition, <laughs> this has existed. And if you talk to people about the future, the Jetsons invariably gets brought up. Now, none of us, I'm sure, I can't see all, who all is here, but um, most people don't realize that the Jetsons, like Melissa and I were too young. We weren't alive when it originally aired and it wouldn't have mattered because we were too, it, it was not a kid show. The Jetsons, aired, do you know how long or when it aired? No. It aired for one season, 1962 to 1963. And it wow. was a show for adults. Wow, this, I didn't this, know that. No, but this flight. So, and it's amazing to me that the Jetsons car has kind of become a, a verbal shorthand to describe the future. Why are we constraining ourselves? Stop and think about that for a moment. And when we think no. about the future of transport, we are still trying to build these flying cars. I don't know if any of you have been to the city of Miami, which is a city that I love. Y'all can't drive in the city of Miami. I don't, I don't know how much I want the craziness on the streets now overhead, right? Um, I'm being glib, but my point is we suffer from a gross lack of imagination. And yeah. so the innovation, I think, when we think about the future, or we think about these different industries, it's very narrow. Oh, yeah. You know, farms are, are the way that they are because that's the way they've been. There are so many other ways to approach agriculture. There are many other ways to approach mobility, moving people, pets, and objects around in things that don't look at all like cars. And yes, I recognize that we have enormous systems like insurance and highway systems and things like that. But, um, but, but part of being a good steward to the generation that comes next, you know, after us is not being hindered by our current mental models. And, and a yeah. lot of what the work that I do is about is, um, you know, allowing yourself to imagine alternatives and to think the unthinkable. Yeah. So there's been some discussion like agriculture. There's been some discussion about how cars, our road systems are also right now in a two dimensional plane and that eventually we're going to need to expand our thinking of three dimensions. And so most people are thinking up which is kind of where you went. Elon Musk is thinking, thinking down because he yep. says the last thing you want is, you know, flying cars overhead, that the noise and the disruption would just be terrible. Mm -hmm. Well, so I would say, again, I think that that is near term restrictive thinking. So let's think through all, if, if I go back to those, and I know you haven't seen this, but the, our 11 macros, right? All these different sources of change. What might influence the future of cars that are overhead in the future versus cars that are on the ground or somewhere else? Well, I come back to climate change. Um, I don't know if anybody's been in a vehicle in the air during inclement weather, but, but a small vehicle, even if you have automated systems that are pretty good at immediately recognizing and regulating, the truth is that microclimates are very hard to predict. And it's not like doing computer vision on the ground where you can train and, you know, you can train a system to recognize objects in different permutations. It would be challenging to do that given the current state of recognition and AI today, because there's too many different variables, again, that we're not in control of in any way. So flying cars is an interesting idea for the future, but is it plausible? given what we know to be true about the fact that we can't control for, you know, weather. So if the answer to that is yes, it potentially is implausible, then why not go underground? Or why not, you know, think of trains in a different way? What about a pneumatic tube system? I mean, there's so many different ways for us to be thinking about this. And my position is if we make this, if we can incent the industry to disrupt itself, then, then we figure out a way for, for these companies to be heroes to their shareholders. They have fiduciary responsibility, right? So is there a way that everybody can win? And I think, again, that is a very different approach that I, I don't see happening a lot when we oh. talk about the future and we talk about growth. So, you know, one of the places where I do see it happening, where I was actually quite surprised to see old incumbent industry giant players 
being kind of bold and thinking about a new future is in agriculture. Uh, and I know this is an area where we share a common interest. Um, and I want to bring up like cellular agriculture, because uh, it's, it's like something I've I've been extremely interested in for probably the last five years. If you've been coming to a lot of our fireside chats at Food Bond, you know we've had some people through to talk about this. But uh, cellular agriculture is the idea that you can take a tiny cell biopsy from the shoulder of a cow, for example, or another animal, and you can grow meat with the amino acids um, in a like fermentation in a vat, and basically grow that meat without growing the whole cow. And that has a tremendous number of advantages. One of which is that uh, you know cow is a cow is a great big entropy machine. Right, you a cow is designed to be a cow, not designed to be a snake, a steak. So, uh, you know, it, it uses a lot of calories over its lifetime. So the ratio of calories that go in versus the calories you get out is very poor. Uses a lot of water, produces a ton of methane, really bad for the environment. And so there's this idea that growing meat is going to become more efficient. And a lot of people. An, like find that just like, ugh, what? No, that'll never happen. It seems so gross and weird, like out of a movie. But my friend Paul Shapiro has this great quote, or maybe he's quoting someone, I can't remember, it's in his book, Clean Meat, where he talks about the fact that we used to get ice from frozen lakes. We used to drive out to lakes and cut out a slab of ice, and then the ice men would put them on trucks and bring them into town and sell the ice. And it was very dangerous, and there was a lot of waste. And now we think that's crazy. We grow ice in our freezers, and that seems like the normal way of doing things. Uh, and he makes the argument that we're going to feel that same way about meat, and then there won't be uh, you know, live whole animals involved. Is that an area that you've been following at all? Is that something where we could apply this tool? Yeah. So, well, so the strategic foresight, I wouldn't call a tool. It's more of like a method. discipline. Yeah. Discipline. But all of the tools within it. Totally. Um, and I should just also mention, so I teach, I'm, I'm the one that teaches the weird, one of the weird classes um, at Stern. So there's a, there's a full semester MBA course on strategic foresight and the future of tech. Um, so we go through this entire thing from soup to nuts. And every week we introduce a new piece of the methodology um, and also uh, a core emerging technology that we go to in depth. And I say we because I teach the class, but I am joined by six people um, that work at FTI who act as individual coaches. And so everybody who comes through yeah. the class gets incredible amounts of hands-on, one-on-one, um, -on -one small group attention. Uh, and then we move into the final part of the semester where we do live case studies. Anyways, um, so yes, cellular ag, uh, is uh, and cellular biology is a, a big focus of mine. So my research areas are AI and something called synthetic biology. And uh, what you're talking about falls under that umbrella. Um, so roughly speaking, um, I was so my a book that I worked on. I, I, I my last I just have a I have a brand new book that just came out. But the previous book. Um, it was called The Big Nine, and it was about, it was came out in 2017. I started working on it in 2015. And it was about the big nine companies that I thought were going to shape the future of AI, for better or worse. Uh, six were in the US, are in the US, three are in China. And sort of before everybody was talking about um, this sort of coming Cold War, I, I was exploring it in that book. Here's why I'm bringing that up, because while I'm doing that research, I kept stumbling upon academic papers and, and articles and things where the same companies working on the frontiers of AI were weirdly also working in biology. And mm. I, again, that's like a contradiction. And in my world, a contradiction is a, is a big, big flag. So uh, here's what's going on. Um, it is now possible to program biological systems the way that we program computers. So you know, when Watson and Crick uh, built on uh, somebody else's Rosalind Franklin's research and gave her no credit for it, because turns out Watson was not only racist and homophobic, but also really didn't like women. Um, wow. That would that sort of gave us read access to DNA. So if I use a computer analogy, um, once CRISPR happened, so CRISPR is that sort of set of molecular scissors that allows us to edit. Uh, genetic code that gave us read and edit access to life. Well, we've sort of crossed into this new territory where it's now possible to go in, sequence uh, genetics, like a genetic sequence, see what it is, but reformulate it 
in order to give an organism new or enhanced capabilities to make it more adaptable or less adaptable. Um, and effectively what this gives us is right access to biological wow. code. Um, and the way that you do this uses a lot of the AI systems that exist. So um, you use what looks like a database editor. You can load the DNA into those software tools and you know, move things around in code um, and sort of program systems. So if the, if the original um, programming language of computing is ones and zeros on the biology side, you've got ACTG, right? And basically, once you're done, you just send it to something that's kind of like a, like a 3D printer and you get printed out a new molecule. Um, I think that 10 years from now, we're gonna be talking about synthetic biology the way that we currently talk about AI, which is to say, everybody's gonna have an opinion on it. A lot of those opinions are gonna be wildly uninformed, <laughs> um, but from a business perspective, this is gonna be just an enormous place where investors are dumping money. You know, every company has, has a, you know, is trying to leverage it in some way, or they're gonna feel like they're left behind. Because while yes, um, you can certainly engineer different meat. This is also about industrial materials, um, water, uh, creating beer in different ways, uh, flavorings, perfumes, paints. It gives us optionality to deal with climate change in ways that people aren't really thinking yet. Um, and it potentially creates incredibly challenging geopolitical <laughs> Uh, situation is the way that AI has, has started to. There's also like a health and medicine component. Wow. Wow. Uh, I have another question I want to ask about that. But before I forget, guys, don't forget to post your questions in the Q&A because we will turn to Q&A here in a few minutes. So just drop those into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, back to what you're saying. Who do you see as being the big players here? Yeah. Well, let me go back to your meat example for just a moment. So I think it's a good one. Um, I don't know if everybody remembers this, but in February, the entire country, the entire United States shut down uh, for this annual event where men uh, carried the ball down the field to have the points, uh, the Super Bowl. I've and heard about that. Yes, heard about that. And it is part of our constitution that Americans who aren't carrying the ball must eat chicken wings. And on one day in February, Americans ate 1.45 billion, with a B, chicken wings, which required 750 million chickens. Now, the question is, what kind of chicken was this? So if you go back a century, the chickens that you might have gotten at a market weighed about a kilogram, maybe 1.5 kilograms. So they were small. Um, it took them quite a while to grow and they required feed. You had to pick up after them. You know, it, it, you could grow them, but it was hard to do that at scale. Fast forward to today, and the chicken packaging that you see at your grocery store may say free range, but all that really means is that the chickens aren't in individual cages. So they may be freely able to range around their commercial warehouse, but they're like 30,000 chickens shoved into that commercial warehouse. There's nowhere for them to go. Um, they are pumped full of hormones. They are pumped full of... Um, you know, antibiotics and things. And today's chickens are monsters. You know, they weigh upwards of three kilograms sometimes. So they're, they're more than double the size. They also mature in a fraction of the amount of time and require less feed. So if you stop it for a moment and think about the science that went into creating fat chickens fast, you know, that took a lot of, uh, that, that, that requires a lot. Um, now, what, so, you know, we don't, we don't call those chickens commercial warehouse, super fat, pumped full of hormones, questionably not great for us in the long run chickens. We just call it chicken. The meat that you're describing, Melissa, a lot of people get cringy, right? And they call it lab grown meat. Yeah. What here, here's, you know, here's an alternative future. What if a few years from now, um, we eat 1.45 billion chicken wings, but those chicken wings were grown in what's called a bioreactor. So it's just this, the pr process that you described, but we get clean chickens, ch heritage chickens that have never been pumped full, 
of all that stuff, and we're able to grow them. Now, at the moment, we can't do that at scale and produce a 10 cent wing, but that's right now. The technology yeah. exists today to do this, and they've, that type of chicken has already gone on sale. So in Singapore, uh, it took two years to pull through a regulatory process, but, syn but synthetically created cellular chicken um, went on sale at $17 a portion. So if we could do this with chicken, what else might we do? Well, certainly beef at some point. Pork is something people are already working on, but suddenly this unlocks the door to many other types of meats. So you could eat panda and not feel bad about it. Oh, oh. You could eat a <laughs> Labrador retriever one. and not feel bad about it. I will tell you that I don't eat, you know, I don't really eat meat as much, you know, whenever, for many reasons. Um, but if I had access to clean meat that just was pumped full of good amino acids and, you know, we know was better for the environment, um, probably better for us, definitely better from the, for the animal. They're um, a lot happier about it for sure. You know, I would eat Panda all day long if it, if it tasted good. Wow. Uh, yeah. And another thing that comes up, I think with it, that um, doesn't get much airtime is that if you make the meat in a bioreactor, it's not contaminated with all the bacteria that, right, right. that animal sources are contaminated with and thus, and thus it lasts longer. So it ends up creating a lot of economies and how you can ship it, store it, these things like that. Right. So it drastically shortens the supply chain. You no longer need a cold chain, a cold chain. So again, um, I picture a place like Singapore. Um, Singapore has to import all of its chicken and Singapore eats a staggering amount of chicken. You know, if you can ferment and manufacture chicken based chicken, um, you no longer have to worry about importing and you potentially become an exporter. So this is great for when we talk about the cold chain, which we know is, is corrosive to our environment. Um, it also shortens our supply chain, so that makes them more resilient. Um, you know, we don't have a single source of potential problem anymore. Um, so all of that's great. However, we also have to think about knock-on effects that are negative. Um, there are agrarian cultures and countries in the world whose main export is stuff like, you know, food that they grow. Um, and so we would have to think through how does this potentially destabilize yeah. the existing uh, workforce, the existing economy? And if the answer is, you know, it really destabilizes them, great. Then we start earlier there, even before the tech is ready, to prepare that market to be disruptive in a way that actually creates opportunities for everybody. Yeah, yeah. No, I think about that a lot. I mean, I think in this instance, I think the path is inevitable, but what we can manage is the speed and the volatility. Yeah. Because, you know, as human societies, we can adapt to just about anything, but we just can't do it fast, right? So a lot of times when you see communities suffer, it's because the change happened quicker than people were able to respond to it. But we've we've changed our lives enormously over the last, sure. you know, however many years. Uh, so you have, let's go back to the companies for a minute and how they process this information, how they take this advice. Because mm -hmm. I know uh, I know a startup named Memphis Meats that works on you know cell based. Mm -hmm. I think mostly beef, I'm guess, and maybe some maybe some bacon. I don't know. Mm -hmm. that I've been following some startups in this space, and then I know Cargill and Tyson are making big investments in this area. <laughs> Like, you know, funding yeah. some of these small companies. But how does a big incumbent like like Cargill one or Tyson, largest, some of the largest meat packers right. in the world, think about that transition? How are they managing it, planning for it? it you know, that, that's going to be a lot of disruption for them, right? It's a whole new supply chain, I suppose. Right. So so Memphis is now upside. They changed their um they changed their oh, they changed the name. name. Yeah, they're now outside oh, wow. foods and they've got a slightly different remit at this point or slightly different um, purpose. But you know, Tyson and Cargill are, are both big investors in the space, which is a smart thing to do. Now, you could also say that at one point, um, Exxon was a huge investor in biofuels. Uh, and, and ultimately, some might argue, it was because of Exxon that that never took off. I would argue yeah. that the science wasn't quite ready and there were some other issues there, but. Um, Chevron supposedly bought a big uh, uh, 
geothermal plant that was operating in the in the Southern California producing a lot of energy bought it to shut it down. Yeah. So you could worry about that. You know, and Elon Musk, as we speak, just bought Twitter and maybe tomorrow or two weeks from now, Twitter has poof gone as well. I, I don't know. That would be a very expensive financial bonfire, but I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> um, so, so what does all of this mean? You know, I think depending on who you talk to, and, and again, this is one the meat is one tiny sliver of this bigger synthetic biology ecosystem. So within the food product space, you know, there is meat, there is fish, there is dairy, there is cheese, there is fermenting different types of beers. There's wine in the room that's over there. I've got a bottle of bourbon that is okay. Uh, that was made using some of the processes that we're describing. Um, there's a, something you can drink, um, before you go out and drink that enzymatically combats the, the things that cause hangover. Um, so, so there's a lot, I think as with all of these technologies, there's a hype cycle and, you know, Cargill and Tyson, I think if they were wise would put together a 10 year plan or longer, um, and, you know, and use strategic foresight to map out the deep futures of their organizations and be willing to imagine a future where, where, you know, farms don't exist anymore the way that they do today. Um, I, I know that when we, we haven't worked with either one of those companies, when we do this with other companies, when we have executives who champion this idea of thinking the unthinkable for the sake of trying to figure out where there are alternative ways to grow. Um, and then not just as an academic exercise, but to literally reverse engineer that to start taking action now in, you know, in ways that are incremental, but lead to excremental, you know, excremental, ah, exponential, not excremental. <laughs> excremental. I blame this that stupid one. <laughs> piece of plastic in my mouth. Exponential <laughs> growth over time. Um, you know, th those companies tend to be pretty agile and they tend to survive, like their long-term survivability looks great. So I don't know what these companies have in mind. What I can tell you is that there's an enormous amount of interest in this space. Kathy Wood, uh, I, I was at a synthetic biology conference with her, I guess she was virtual at that point, um, last week. And she was talking about synthetic biology. Uh, Eric Schmidt, this is one of his key areas that he pays a lot of attention to. He was there in person. Um, so, to, so there are some sort of big names attached to this. And what that tends to do is, especially in this day and age, it motivates um, day traders to uh, dump money into stocks and, and start playing around. And then people get excited and you know things get hyped. This is a long horizon tech, what we're talking yeah. about. Long horizon. Because even once the tech gets created and it works, you've got to then scale it and scaling it is no small feat. And even if you scale it, you've got regulatory issues to contend with, and then you've got market issues to contend with. So this is long horizon stuff, but it is high impact and potentially one of our best chances to survive on this planet, if that's what we would like to do. Yeah. Um, so my, my point in saying all of this is that like artificial intelligence, synthetic biology is on a very long horizon and that means we all have to vigilantly pay attention, but we have to be willing to be patient. And sometimes the market doesn't allow that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. In fact, it could, if, it, if there's too much of a frenzy early on, that's going to result in a crash. And then people are going to be more scared away from that space, right? Yeah, I'm sure you see that. You've got to see that all the time with people not quite understanding innovation cycles and getting confused at the wrong inflection points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. All right. Well, let's go and see what kinds of questions we have in the chat room. Uh, I'm going to put this over here. All right. So the first question we have is how from Marie Sultana Robinson, how would someone train to be a futurist? What kinds of information and disciplines are needed? And I'm going to take it a step further than what she said. Like, can I major in this in school? Yeah. Like what, what majors would I study? Yes. So please take my class. Uh, it's really good. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to need more than just your class, right? Yes, you need. You definitely need more. Our class is just going to give you an, an overview. Um, you can actually get a PhD in this. So outside of the US, there are multiple great universities. 
um, where you can get advanced degrees in this uh, at business schools and economics programs and things like that. Um, this academic discipline, while it came from the United States originally, has just taken a little bit longer to, um, I think, to, to find its place. Outside of the US, I don't have to explain what I do to anybody. I go to anywhere in Europe, I go to the Nordics, I say that I work in strategic foresight, everybody knows what I mean. Um, if I say that I'm a quantitative futurist, which is actually what I am, I don't have to explain that to anybody. So I've, if I'm in China, Singapore, Japan, Korea, no problem. The US is a little slower on this, um, which makes sense. We don't really do any long-term thinking in this country. And unfortunately it's getting shorter. So if you're interested, um, there are online courses that you can take the Institute for the, well, we offer master classes um, for companies as our, you know, our company does. Institute for the Future offers one-off sort of, you can enroll as an individual classes. There's a ton of books. Um, I feel like if you look at our, I used to keep sort of a public list of books to read. And, you know, if, if you're interested in really studying this, um, the University Wait, of I'm Houston. Gonna, what's, your favorite, what's your favorite starter book on this? The first book someone should read. Yeah, the first book is a book called The Art of the Long View by Peter Schwartz. Peter Schwartz right. was at Royal Dutch Shell, which I know is like not great right now, but, but he was part of the team under a, guy, a crazy Frenchman in a good way named Pierre Vac, um, who used what I'm talking about to identify the plausible oil shocks that he thought that they thought were on the horizon, which then prevented Shell from imploding like their competitors did. Um, and it proved in the marketplace how valuable this work is. And so this work has a long successful tradition in petroleum, <laughs> government, um, uh, but it also exists at Amazon. You know, it's, 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 it's at Ford. It, it's practiced in a lot of companies that you know. Okay, so you emphasized business and economics. Uh, as being two of the main fields. Any other fields you want to throw in there for yeah. study? I mean, I think, I think we're, as a discipline, very aligned with, with what the center does. This is an inter, like a sort of a cross-disciplinary um, type of activity. So uh, you need to pull in, I mean, it's, it's a process that you have to learn how to do, um, yeah. just like you have to learn accounting, the process of, and the form, the, the methodology and everything else. Um, but layered into that is, you know, behavioral economics and a little bit of game theory and some design thinking and some traditional Statistics, strategy research stuff. design. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. I will I tell you that you if you're somebody interested in tech or you're interested in the future, um, please explore some of what I'm talking about, but that alone does not make you a futurist. Cool. All right. We got another great question here uh, from... Let's see, scroll up a little bit here. Vanessa Perwin, since many of these industries are highly regulated, how do you factor in the government regulation piece of the analysis when potentially the environment can change every two to four years, depending on who is in power? And I'm yep. going to add to that one, too, and ask you, how often are you advising governments on stuff like this? So let me answer the second question second, and I'll, I'll take the first one first. Um, so that's a great question. And the answer is, you know, we don't, and any, any scenario that we might build is potentially outdated tomorrow, right? Now we try to make sure that we are gathering the right sources of data so that that doesn't happen. And quite frankly, it's never happened um, to us, but it, you know, it could happen. The laws of physics could break tomorrow. I am open to totally alternative uh, outcomes on things. And I mean that. So what does that mean in a real world context? It means that we do the best that we can given what we know to be true in the models that we've built. However, these scenarios are not intended to sit on a shelf. So they are intended to do something called rehearsing the future. And again, the point of this isn't predicting, it's being prepared for anything that comes. So that means vigilance. It means I have to get updated. Um, and we're in a slightly more volatile situation than we had like over the past six years because of our past administration and the current situation with Russia and Ukraine and the global instability, my job got a lot harder um, six years ago. Uh, and, you know, it just means that we have to be much more cautious and careful about what we're seeing and be willing to recalibrate. Now on the question about government, um, so we are not McKinsey. We are a consulting firm that literally does one thing 
and that's it. We just do foresight. So from an economic, so like a business model point of view, our business model, we charge too much. I can't, I can't come up with a blended hourly rate that's going to make sense for a government agency. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, it doesn't make sense. That being said, um, I care very, very deeply about public service. And I feel like if you want to be a member of the country that you were born in, you need to be, you need to like up, you need to keep, keep up your membership. And that means public service in some form. Um, so, so we donate or heavily discount or just sort of give away um, work back to federal government in the United States um, regularly. And then when it comes to other governments, again, government is slow moving, but it's also a long-term steward. I, my, my interest in this is long-term better futures. So that means involving government. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I want to ask you a question related to that real quick. Uh, do you have any best practices for guarding against your own personal bias? Because it seems like oh, yeah. anytime, anytime you're looking at long trends, bias can get vastly yeah. amplified. So you have to really think about how, what you're injecting into that. Yeah. Great question. Um, so the first is awareness. And usually we, we use a buddy system when we're doing this work. So you can do the individual research and the individual, mo- like the modeling on your own, but um, y- you got to have others in the group. I, I am very, very, very good at risk. Very good. Um, you give me a set of data points. I will tell you an apocalyptic hellscape, like my brain is very good at that. I have a harder time on opportunity and growth. So I know it, that I need to surround myself with people who tend to balance in the other direction. Um, you know, it's going to be hard because I don't believe that we're living in Elon Musk's uh, version of the multiverse, although I don't not believe in a multiverse. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we are interacting with new data points all day long, every day, which means that our, we are developing biases in different ways every day that we may not be aware of. So doing this work in a group, but having the sort of ability to check for those biases is really important. So anytime we start a project, the very first thing we do is a baseline. And it's a very specific way of, of talking to all of the stakeholders in a project, um, asking them, it's kind of like a qualitative assessment, but one of the things we're checking for is bias in the stakeholders that we're working with. Um, so it's super, super important and, you know, hard to do. That's really interesting. You know, um, in, in my field, we sometimes look at sort of a, a binary difference in perspective with bias, and one is risk aversion versus mm-hmm. gain seeking, right? Mm-hmm. So there's this idea that some managers in some contexts are going to be primarily risk avoidant. They're trying to r- minimize loss, and some managers in some situations are going to be primarily gain seeking. They might be more opportunistic or and optimistic. If with those two different lenses, would I get radically different results from looking at this data? Yeah. And again, that's why, so there's a, a part of the process that we do to rapidly prototype, the rapidly prototype scenario. I guess what I didn't foresee or forecast my inability to talk with this thing in my mouth. Oh, um, you're doing pretty well. You, you can't tell from here. Okay, good. Um, so we use something called the axes of uncertainty. It's a two by two matrix that I'm sure many of you have used in other ways. In our case, we have a tax, we have a giant list of uncertainties that we marry together with the signals and trends that we will have curated and researched. And basically we create different permutations on the X and the Y axis. Um, and, and we say, well, if these combinations of two things happen at once, uh, what are the p- potential next order impacts? And if that happens, then what is the next impact? And then what, and then what, and then what? Um, and we marry those clusters of uncertainty signals and trends on the axes intentionally. So we're looking for highly non-correlating, highly impactful combinations of things. What's great about doing this is uh, it, it, to some degree, addresses the bias because we're looking for, like it's weird combinations of stuff. The purpose of this is to see around corners and to force ourselves to get into that area of reperception. Um, and so that's one way of mitigating bias. And then again, just being aware that sometimes we, you know, we will have teams that are 
especially like finance, like I can tell you what industries tend to index in which direction. Um, you know, but we know that in advance and we we sort of mitigate that by by balancing that group either through using a different version of a framework. Um, if we're doing it collaboratively with them or by supplementing the group with people from our team or even outsiders who we know will push in the other direction. Okay. Uh, Marie wants to know if your class is online. Could they take it online? It is not. <laughs> it's not. That's unfortunate. But we can uh, we can talk about something at, at some point. Okay. Uh, Rich, maybe I can make that happen, actually. That's like one of my very tiny areas of influence. Uh, what about uh, Richard Praveet says here that it sounds like there's not a single industrial firm in the big nine. Um, well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by industrial firm, but no. So like if you're thinking about NVIDIA, um, so the big nine, again, refers to, from my point of view, the nine companies that are shaping the futures of, of uh, AI. Um, in China, it's BAT, the BAT, Baidu, Te uh, Alibaba, and Tencent. And in the US, it's Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and IBM. The IBM one always is a little bit of a surprise to everybody. But the reason for this is because um, they're a giant corporate entity and, you know, the, it's these companies where a lot of the talent is being pulled and they are managing bigger, bigger structures and ecosystems. So NVIDIA is like best in class when it comes to almost everything when it, that, that it works on graphics, computer vision. Re NVIDIA is actually in the synthetic biology space. They partnered with a company wow. called ABSCI, A-B-S-C-I, which is um, using AI to do better prediction to like speed up drug discovery in a very, very interesting, clever way. But NVIDIA is narrow. So they're best in class. You cannot follow AI without follow, paying very close attention to everything that company does. But that company is not underpinning, you know, many, many other things. So, so that's kind of why. I mean, I'm, why are people surprised to hear IBM in there? IBM was a very early player in artificial intelligence. Yeah, uh, very early. Um, and again, I, you know, we the, the my research uh, took into account not just what's happening in the market, but where they're pulled, like who's got a high concentration of talent, funding, um, research papers, like a bunch of other things. And for the moment, this could change. Uh, but for the moment, I would, I would. Even with their recent foibles over the past two years, I, I would keep IBM on that list. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Brown asks if this is different uh, or similar to, I suppose we'll also ask, uh, from John Nesbitt and his megatrends. Yes, very different. Um, so again, I've got a very different point of view on this. Um, there are a lot of people who every year or every couple of years, you know, they write sort of, um, these are the top tech trends that matter. Um, or these are the mega trends. These are the, and it, they have catchphrases and they're memorable. Um, we have a database of about 600 longitudinal trends. Most of them would bore you to pieces. Um, but it's oftentimes the boring stuff that matters. And sometimes it's very, you know, it's very hard to encapsulate. And this is my constant struggle very hard to encapsulate the stuff that matters into a single PowerPoint slide uh, or into a like neat and tidy, cool sounding mega trend title. Um, but again, you know, my background's a little different and I know what it takes to get action. And I also know what it takes to create, you know, for, for these scenarios to be something that actually drives um, strategic decision-making. So they're just different. They're different. And um, it doesn't mean that, that the megatrends work is bad. It's just, it's just very different from what we do. I think our work is intended to drive strategic decisioning, get companies to do longer term planning, get governments to do longer term planning, you know, so. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, all right. Marie wants to know where we can find your book list. That's a good question. I was just thinking that. That's a good question. I've, I will post it on LinkedIn. How about tomorrow? I feel like I've done that before. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't know where it is. So if you connect with me, on, this is not like a ploy to connect with me on LinkedIn. I just don't know where else to put it. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram. No, I, 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 here's the thing. Like, I know I put it. So off you know the top of my head, I don't know. It might be a, like a medium post from a while ago. Basically what I did was I like, 
took a picture of all the, like the, your starter kit of books. In fact, everybody who works for us, who comes and joins our team, they get, this is their like onboarding. They get a giant box and the box is a copy of every one of these books along with um, pens that I like and some other things. Um, wow. Anyhow, I, I just, I, I feel like it was a LinkedIn post or it might've been a medium post. It's somewhere online is sort of a list of like, these are the books that I recommend that you get started with. If you send it to us, I'll have Elizabeth send it to the entire okay. participant yeah. list. I just and have so to that figure will, out where it is. That will be their little, you know, bonus yeah. for having attended. Um, here's a great question. Jeffrey asked the ch says the chicken example is interesting, but where would you be getting the data to see the foresight fr data from to see the foresight that the chicken industry would change? Well, I don't know that they would change. All I can tell you All is you know is that we need to change. All that I can tell you is, and again. I could be wrong. Um, this is a core difference. I know that doesn't set well uh, with a lot of people, but I acknowledge that like there's an insurmountable amount of data and that that impacts everything that's happening all the time. What do I know to be true and is very likely a long term trend that's, you know, that I can bet on. Um, yeah. We're not going to come to we, there is a, the, the countries that are pro producing a lot of pollution um, coming together to come up with a plan that is going to significantly imp like impact in a truly significant way um, CO2 emissions to the point where it actually reverses the direction that we're headed in, that is a low probability event from my point of view. I, so if that's the case, um, then we have a couple options. One, you know, we start investing in and rapidly testing other things like geoengineering, which is politically kind of a hot potato. Um, or we invest in other technologies, which will take a little bit longer, but change what agriculture, CO2, you know, if you look at CO2 as a feedstock, you can suck more of it out of the air doing different things. Um, so anyhow, we have some different pathways, but what we know to be true is that that doesn't change our inclement weather situation. Yeah. Um, so, so that tell, and that's going to accelerate. So that's all I need to know. Um, what that tells, you know, if you start from there, that means that our supply chains become unstable. We haven't even layered in, we haven't layered in like geopolitical problems in Brazil and uh, Russia, among other places. So, or like, you know, we don't have any wild cards in there, like another global pandemic. So, you know, we're, we're walking on a pretty fragile ground right now. Yeah. So for that reason, to me, it seems like a no-brainer. Um, I wow. would I would go where I can make the influence. That's cool. You know, if we had more time, where I would love to take this is that yeah. I personally worry about our growth bias, overpopulation, the idea that we always want to drive increasing demand instead of thinking about finding an equilibrium that we can sustain. Uh, it seems so short-sighted to me. And I just, I'm ask you, the last question I'm going to ask you here is: When you look at all this data, does it make you fearful for the future? <laughs> I get this question all the time. Um, so is this our is this our last question? Yeah, I think we're okay. almost out of time. So let me can I plug my book? Yeah, can I do that. This Please. is the new book. This is what we've been talking about all night long. So this book is called uh, The Genesis Machine, and it is a it's it's a book about science. But I pr I am not a scientist, so this is not a science book. It is readable in like two days. I can assure you. It goes into detail on all of this, but there's a big chunk of this book that talks about the business ecosystem that I think might be worthwhile. Now, um, there's a whole chapter on this book, it, from the book, um, that should scare the absolute shit out of you. Uh, and it's because it's, it's, it's all about the risks and it's, the risks are terrifying. And I get asked a question all the time, given what I do for a living, do I sleep? Do I stay awake all night long? Yeah. Here's, here's what I would say to that. Um, ultimately, I'm a pragmatist. So, you know, I think about this a little bit like a haunted house. Um, when I was a little kid, I begged that, that all the cool kids in elementary school went to Myers Mansion, which was this haunted house every fall. All the cool kids went, begged my dad, please, please, please take me to the haunted house. Take me to Myers Mansion. Uh, we stood online for like three hours. And got to the front and I, and we got in and it was dark, you know, it was a spooky lobby, totally dark. Um, we got through the first room. I think somebody stuck their hand through a wall and just poked me and I completely lost my mind. 
And I was like, I want to leave. Uh, and from that point forward, my dad said, we are never, you know, like, think wisely before you beg me to do something. My point is, why do we get scared? Um, if we were to turn on the lights for the haunted house, we would see everything that's coming. We may not know how to get to the end. We don't, may not know where the exit is, but we're not going to be surprised because we've got different data points. So it becomes yeah. less scary. Yeah. What I do for a living is turn on the lights. We're still oh, in I the haunted that. house. Stuff is still scary. And we don't know, maybe there's a horrible thing that we're going to fall through over there. I don't know. But we can see things coming. We yeah. slow down time so that we don't feel surprised. That is what I do. And that's actually why I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not awake all night long. That is amazing. Amy, we are out of time, but that was an amazing, amazing talk. And I'm, I'm going to read your book. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure everybody just found this as fascinating as I did. 